good question. I don't know if you heard his question. I'll try to restate it since I got the mic. What is success and what does success look like? What are the goals? And then what is failure and what does that look like and how do we reassess? I'm going to go back to what I'm going to hopefully learn with you in the coming weeks is I believe the, the goal and the agenda is the great go mission. And I'm not trying to be flippant and giving you an easy response, but I think the goal and the mission is this. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. That's to Jesus. So Jesus is the owner of this church, not me and not you. Therefore, because of that, because he's the big boss, he's the master, therefore, go. And that word go is as you go. It may be across the street or across the world and just as you go. And God makes that clear, so there's a lot in there. But therefore, go, make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, or lo, depending on your translation, remember, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. So I believe success is this, based upon the Great Commission, is that we're willing <clears throat> to go, <clears throat> some of us globally, many of us locally, because that's the percentage. There's a few that go long-term, Groby, but most of us are in our village, in our community, but our agenda is to make disciples. And so if disciples are being made, because disciples, it may start with an atheist and that journey to come to Christ, and then they get baptized, and then they grow up in Christ and make more disciples. I think success is more people not only trusting Christ and getting baptized. Well, that's huge. That's just a new beginning. The goal is mature, reproducing believers. So the goal is maturing, multiplying believers. And so my desire is, as a pastor, according to Philippians, Ephesians 4.11, is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. So while I need to make disciples, I do that in a bigger picture level as well as one-on-one. -on -one, but I've got to equip you. And so one of the ways that I want to hopefully have biblical success, based upon what Rafi's asking, which is <clears throat> the $64,000 question, is I want to equip you so that we'll each be able to be a part of the disciple-making process. And so discipleship happens long-term on Sunday mornings. Even if it's a crowd of hundreds, well, obviously that's not the most intimate form of discipleship. It happens that way. Guess what? It's happening tonight because there's some interaction. It's not quite as intimate as a gathering of four or five, but there's interaction and we're able to kind of wrestle and think through these things. So this is discipleship happening. Uh, discipleship's happening in other belong groups that are focused on God's word and it's happening one-on-one -on -one with people. But the goal is not just to give you more knowledge because a lot of you have a lot of knowledge already, but the goal is that your knowledge will turn into obedience and that obedience is actually making more disciples. And so with that, you have a good problem that you got a lot of people that are coming to Jesus, a lot of people that need discipleship, and it's also just fresh opportunities to grow them up so they'll create more. And so with that, we've got, we've got the problem we want. So we've got the problem we're looking for. More people are coming to Jesus. Well, some people come from other churches and that's good and that's fine if the Lord leads them here. The goal is we're reaching people for Jesus. There's more people to be baptized. There's more people in the kind of lineup that need to be baptized in the coming weeks. We've been, the Lord's been bringing people to be baptized almost every week. And so we're seeing that and that's part of the process. But the goal is not only baptism and getting them to sit in the seat, but the goal is that they'll raise up and be a part of making disciples. That doesn't mean they're gonna be a preacher or even a, an official teacher, but they're gonna be a part of the discipleship process through hospitality, through loving, through administration, through all of the different spiritual gifts that help to make disciples. A lot of churches can explode really quick and grow from 50 to 5,000 in a few years, and we've seen some of that. Can that be done in a biblical way? It's possible, but it's tough. So maybe because of my limitations on being able to lead, God's helping us to grow slower so I can be a better leader in the process. Would it be great to blow up to 5,000 and I've got to preach 10 times on a weekend? Man, that's a great problem to have, but we also want to make sure we're joining in with God as he's at work. I'll also throw this in on the first day of Pentecost when the church was born. Um, 3,000 people came to Jesus and they were throwing them in those cleansing, you know, ritual water pots to baptize them. I guarantee you they didn't have a six-week Bible study as new believers. They were just learning together as they were understanding the Old Testament. The New Testament was being lived out in front of them and being written over the years to come. And so it was an ongoing relational process. Uh, of discipleship. I like to make everything method, a method, uh, and sometimes it's, it's, it's as much relationship as it is method. And so part of that is one of the strengths I see of Wiregrass Church talking about success is that in this process over the last seven years, we've all had some bumps and bruises. We've all been probably offended or not agreed with everything along the way, and that's part of life. 
but I've also seen a consistency and unity and love and care for one another. And I don't know that I've ever seen it to the significance as I've seen it here. So I believe that being one factor of, of many that makes success um, beautiful. I also know that the Lord adds to his church daily as he sees fit. So there's also some churches that may never run more than 100 that they may be being obedient to God depending on the dynamics of the culture they're in. So I don't ever want to just make it numbers, but souls are numbers, and so that does matter. So I, I think we've got some measurements that are in the right direction because we don't want to have a church that's a mile wide and an inch deep. You know what that means? I remember one mega church pastor said that after he'd been there for 20 years. He got caught up in a lot of mess after that. I won't even say his name. Um, but he, he woke up one day and said, oh my goodness, I've created this church that's a mile wide and inch deep and we haven't made reproducing disciples. Everybody's a consumer. Everybody's wanting the next show. Everybody's wanting the next circus. And so there's some of that tension of discipleship, but it may look different in different contexts. I don't want to be a 10,000 seat auditorium and everybody's just a consumer looking for the next show and the next smoke and mirrors. We do want to do things with excellence, whatever we do, whether it's music or whoever's preaching or or, 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 or when we have discipleship opportunities and even fellowship opportunities. We want them to do, be done well. I always, I know this sounds trite, but I said even when we have food, when we have a fall festival, guess what? I want us to have good food. Don't buy those cheapest burgers. Let's buy good food and enjoy our time together. Am I being superficial? No, I just, I just want things to be done well. Does that make sense? And so does the quality of the food ultimately matter? No, but we do want things to be done well, but not for a show. We want everything to be done with excellence.